Is bone grafting necessary in a non odulade union? So, what's a non union? That uh, seemed to be a, a reasonable, reasonable starting point. So, I asked Dave Elliott because Dave Elliott's always, David Elliott is a good, good starting point for, for discussions on this. Because if you, if you take what you read in the books, it's not necessarily how you think about it in practice. So, David thinks of it as a non union is a fracture that won't heal until somebody does something to it. I put to him something slightly different. I thought a non-union was a fracture that was failing to unite when I thought it should. And a delayed union was one that was not uniting as quickly as I thought it should. And that, because that seems to be fairly practical about what, you, what you're thinking about when you're seeing in a clinic. And it also then allows you to take into various groups of things that you see before you. So this... I don't think that should unite, really. I mean, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a fra it's a fracture, and you look at it, and you think, that isn't just going to join, is it? And so they're not the things that we're sitting looking at in clinics, by and large, thinking, I've dealt with this fracture, I think it should join, and it hasn't, what should I do next? If there's a big bit missing like this, if there's pus pouring out of it, or if the bone is clearly dead, then they're not non-unions in the sense that we're often worried about in, in our clinics, where we, we think we've got to the point that it should join and it hasn't. You can't always judge it clearly, though. That girl had no treatment whatsoever except that frame left in place, and it grew. That bit grew back. It's interesting. So you can't judge quite clearly. But more often than, more often than not, you are in a position, something... Well, let's take this one. So this isn't dissimilar from what was said. Her first injury was not an atypical fracture. It was a skiing injury. Fell on the ski slopes in France. She had it nailed. She then had it um, nailed again in France because it was uh, causing dis uh, because the first nail had failed. And that's the second nail. She came back to the UK, and I saw her with that second nail in place. And we were wondering what to do because it was hurting. And then a couple of weeks later, that nail broke. So I know what to do. I've been on the AO course. I've done all of this, so I, I plated it. Plated it. She's got um, uh, a blade plate on there, put it under tension, bone grafted it as well, uh, factor whatever it was. BMP was popular at the time, so she got everything around there. The works were put into that. And she got pain, and you can see it's not healing. There's a, there's a persistent fracture line there, not joined. Persistent fracture line stayed didn't join. Get a CT, it stayed. So I'd thrown the book at it at that point, so I thought, what do I do? Do I do a proximal femoral replacement? This little bit further down the femur, this is a, a young lady, she's um, the, a, in the injury films, then she had um, a delayed union, it was thought, so she was dynamized and she was dynamized at several months. And then after the dynamization, she still had pain and she had pain across at the fracture site, and a CT showed that she had a non-union. How are you going to approach this problem? Am I going to bone graft that? How am I, how am I going to look at it from that point? <coughs> this chap, a bit further down the femur, he's got, there's the injury films, he's been nailed, he progresses, continued pain at the fracture site, CT scan shows that there's a non-delayed union, whatever you wish to say. So we're getting to the point where we're looking at him in the clinic, wondering what we should do next. So if you had, I've, I've tried to get rid of the word principle because I, I, I think it's better to think of it as concept. The concept of treatment, what are the concepts <coughs> of treating uh, uh, a, a fracture? If you believe what we published in the BJJ last year, the vast majority of these circumstances where a fracture has failed to heal when you expect it to, when there just isn't a huge gap, there isn't frank and overt infection or great divots of dead bone, can be remedied by, by rectifying the mechanics, by getting the strain environment area in the area to the right level. So what did we do? What did I do? That first case, percutaneous screws placed across the fracture line two screws placed across there and she went on and united. The second case, two screws placed across the fracture line, she went on and united. The third case, screws placed across the fracture line. In each case, if you believe that the fracture resolves to a single plane of non-union, which is what normally occurs, 
and that the primary force which is occurring in there is a shearing force. If something is moving around on this table, the easiest way to stop it, stick a drawing pin in it. Just hold it where it is. That's straightforward. If you want to stop shearing, place something across the plane of the movement. And you can do it, and you can do it quite straightforwardly. And screw was placed across the fracture plane, didn't necessarily lag it. The first ones did, because you presumed, we're saying the principles lodged in the back of your mind, if you want to stop things moving, you must compress them. But when you think about what's in that area, the working length of a screw placed between those planes of non-union is going to be very short, and a position screw uses much, much more of its thread to give you the grip. There's no wobble in the hole, so I've placed them as positioning screws uh, just to stop the shearing since. Very straightforward to do. Restricted the load bearing, because if you believe that you want to stop shearing at the fracture line, it's probably going to help to take off the load, and it's done as a day case procedure, and you can do it quickly. And one of the, so Stefan Perrin's strain theory is, is well known, and we're, we're all happy to, to accommodate that. One of the areas that people still persist in, in getting, I think, slightly muddled on is about motion and the necessity of motion for fracture healing. And I think that if you go back to John Kenwright's work, who looked at uh, healing with external fixation um, in, um, uh, in tibias and in the laboratory, he showed that to get bone healing to commence, you need movement. And so you need a certain number of cycles per day. But if you carry on and read what he said after that in, in the papers, it's in small writing there but bigger there, is that from about five or six weeks onwards, what you do not need is motion. You need more stability. So he was advocating with the external fixator constructs that they were made more stable, not less. Which is interesting because that's not what we do. That's not your tendency. So if somebody comes back and their fracture has got callus and is tending to heal, you tell them, right, you can wait there now, you can go for it. And probably what's happening is the fracture is healing despite what we're telling them to do. And as opposed to us acting in a constructive way. Once the materials have been recruited, once the bone healing unit has been set into action, it needs stability to bridge the gap. So what I would suggest is that if you accept some definition of non-union or delayed union as the point where you think it's not healing but you think it should, and should you do something about it, then it's worth considering if it's amenable if you have a fracture plane which is amenable, do a day case procedure or put something across the fracture line to stabilise it. There seems to be very little to lose and in the majority of cases it works quite satisfactorily. Thanks very much. <laughs>